introduce uh, Dr. David Schiedermeyer, who's a palliative care specialist in, with Theta Care Palliative Care in Nina, Wisconsin. You may say, what is he talking about on this session? Uh, but this session is really about surgeons and friends. Um, and uh, David was among the first fellows trained at the McLean Center in the 1980s. He is the author of Putting the Soul Back in Medicine, Reflections on Compassion and Ethics, and House Calls, Rounds, and Healings, a Poetry Casebook. Um, Dr. Schiedermeyer is a community associate of the Medical Humanities Program at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and today he'll give a talk that is entitled, We Never Did Too Much Talking Anyway. Dave, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it ain't no use turning on your light, babe. I never know And it ain't no use Turning on your light, babe I'm on the dark side of the road Well, I still wish there was something You could do or say Try and make me change my mind and stay But we never did too much Talking anyway, don't think twice, it's all right. You know, case one is wherein talking made him change his mind and stay. At the hospice, my patient, who's a dying man, was being asked to live a day longer. The man's son was coming in from Georgia, and the hope was that he'd hold on. Hearing is the last thing to go, his daughter told me. We told Dad my brother was on the way. He wouldn't want to go without seeing his son first. He's a fighter. The nurse thinks he'll hold on and he won't die until his son visits. I don't know, I think to myself. I think it's too late. I think he's leaving and he's on the dark side of the road already. I'm not sure there's something you could do or say to make him change his mind and stay. His pancreatic cancer is advanced. He has jaundice and puritis and a rock-hard liver. He has waxing and waning levels of consciousness. He has lung mets, aspiration pneumonia, a death rattle. I walk to the nurse's station and I write in the chart, now no longer declining by the day, but by the hour. Anticipate death quite soon. Symptoms being managed on acute inpatient hospice. I increase the dilated basal dose. I add a second scopolamine patch, and I look for a blank bereavement card back behind the desk. We do have one. I don't even, even bother to pull a fresh label for tomorrow's billing sheet. But I'm wrong. He does live till his son arrives. His family says he opened his eyes, he said a word or two, he squeezed his son's hand. There apparently was something they could do or say to make him change his mind and his body and stay. There apparently was a light that they could turn on. There apparently is a way for a person to control the timing of his or her own death. After working with dying patients for 40 years now, uh, I'm quite sure I don't have the answer on this one. But I do have lots of clinical experience, lots of stories. I have seen people die too early, too late, right on time. I do think there is a unifying hypothesis, even if there's not an answer. Because dying is a walk, it's, it's a journey. I'm walking down that long, lonesome road, babe Where I'm bound, I can't tell Well, you gotta walk That lonesome valley You gotta walk it by yourself Ain't nobody else Gonna walk it for you You gotta walk it 
So when Woody Guthrie wrote these words, and, and when Dylan wrote his words about walking that lonesome road, being on the dark side of the road, they both capture the essence of the journey. It, it just makes sense that we can stop and pause a bit on a journey. We can't stay, we can't go back. Being human is the reason that we are traveling on. Our very mortality is the road that we're on. And both Guthrie and Dylan sing about the loneliness of the journey, the uncertainty of the destination. It's a long and lonesome road. It's a lonesome valley. It's the dark side of the road. We're fundamentally alone in a bad physiologic place. Even if surrounded by faith, family, but if they call out to us, who's to say we cannot hear them? If I live life as a fighter, who is to say that all that training won't help me fight for one more day? If I was a beloved father, who's to say that I can't slow down the journey to hear my son's voice one more time? Who is to say that I can't fall down on my knees in the lonesome valley and grab this good earth with both hands for one more day? Case two, wherein the dying look pretty good considering. In the hospital, the patient, a 90-year-old whose left middle cerebral artery bleed has left her aphasic and unable to swallow, is dying of electrolyte imbalances after about a week. She's had very little in terms of IV fluids. She's had good pain control. Her family has been supportive and thoughtful. They've been playing her favorite songs for her on various devices at the bedside. She has not been receiving any labs or tests. Her hands and feet are cold and the skin over her knees is mottled. She has a Foley in and is making very little urine. As I visit, she's breathing deeply, then she stops, then she breathes once more, then she stops completely. As she does this, her face begins to change, becoming, honestly, truly beautiful. All of us at the bedside, her family, a nurse who's happened to come in, and myself, remark on how beautiful she looks and how peaceful her death was. When your rooster crows at the break of dawn, look out your window and I'll be gone. There's, this is another clinical mystery in my view. Since we always bear the marks of suffering on our faces and bodies, it's hard to die with a totally peaceful expression and without signs of a pretty rough struggle. I'm trying to say that death is rarely pretty. But in palliative care, our goal is to aim for a peaceful, mellow death. It's fantastic for everyone when a person can die with an angelic look on her face. What is it that causes these final moments to be so different aesthetically from person to person? Can we achieve a peaceful look as a standard of care with medications and symptom management? And what does it mean to be gone, as the line of the song says, so quietly, so quickly, so freely at the break of dawn? Key elements in this case are that she was an elder, she was not overly hydrated, she'd not been poked and prodded during the dying process, her cause of death was an overwhelming CNS process. Despite not being in obvious pain, she was on a low-level morphine drip. These are all good principles of palliative care. However, I've seen other patients with just the same disease, just the same configuration of medications, whose faces were not beautifully transformed at the time of death. Why was hers? And what if the opposite happens? What if a person takes a last breath and his or her face appears contorted by fear or pain or even terror? The reason I do care as a palliative care physician is that I want to be able to say, she wasn't suffering. 
And a good facial look and body position at the time of death helps me to say this uh, with the most obvious proofs right in front of us. She was peaceful as a sort of final blessing. Did we ease her suffering? Yes, you can see it on her face. I will say that these deaths tend to have a flyaway appearance. Not only does the rooster crow, not only is the window open, but there seems to be the sound of angel wings. Perhaps there's an angel band, and if we can just get a glimpse before we go, we can make a face, a, a nice face. My latest son is sinking fast. My race is nearly run. My strongest trials, oh, now are past. My triumph has begun. So we've looked at two issues. Can patients change the timetable of their own dying process? I'm arguing a qualified yes. Can we explain medically or even spiritually why some people have more peaceful looking last moments than others? A qualified no, despite the angel wing song. After all, it's, it's not the look on their spirit, it's the look on their body that remains. We can't get that good look often enough. One last case remains. Case three, wherein we lament last words, last rites, last call for alcohol. <laughs> the patient is a 90-year-old immigrant from Greece who never married. He has some sort of disability. It's not clear whether this was congenital or acquired, but it's caused him to have cognitive problems. However, he was able to have an active home life with his siblings, and he was able to play the mandolin. He has a massive uh, MI. His EF is literally less than 10%, one of the lowest EFs I'd ever seen. He literally, it seems to me, has a chain Stokes pattern of heart function. <laughs> I mean, when he makes the slightest movement in bed, he becomes so hypotensive that he looks like he's going to arrest. And then if he stops moving, his cardiac output improves just a bit. He perfuses just a little better and he becomes alert. And then if he moves. Despite all this, it's with great difficulty that I obtain a DNR order and get permission for hospice. His family insists that he be given nutritional supplements many times a day and be forced to eat. And here's the surgical part. <laughs> They request a feeding tube placement, but I meet with him at the bedside with our surgeon. He refuses to place the tube and tells them quite simply, he thinks the procedure will absolutely cause the patient's death. A wise surgeon. Despite obvious aspiration with each feeding, the family continues to force food. The man's last words are, I don't want to eat. <laughs> Our hospice nurse is present at the time of his death and she has to stop the man's sister from trying to feed him even after he's dead. She says as kindly as she can, it's not time to feed him anymore. He's not able to eat. This last call for food and alcohol, so to speak, is something many family members try to do for their loved ones. It's tempting to show love by continuing to feed someone even when they're clearly dying. But can we learn anything from his last words? 
his response to all this fussing around him? Is there a more helpful ritual than trying to put food in a man's mouth at just the time he's literally losing control of his airway? Mama took this badge off of me. I can't use it anymore. It's getting dark, too dark to see. Feels like I'm knocking, knocking on heaven's door. I mean, I think Dylan has it right again. At the end of life, instead of trying to put something in someone's body like food, when they can't possibly use food for the journey, we should keep it on the tray. We should symbolically take their badges off. Their duties to us are fulfilled. Or if not, at least they can't do them anymore. They have no use for any of these things. We take our expectations our guilt and shame, our dependence, our burdens, off them. Off comes the badge, out comes the tube. The food is left on the tray, a symbol of our love. The extra beer is left open, untouched on the bar, and there they stay. The last call for food and alcohol is passed. We touch their hands, but we don't hold on. We let go so they can use their hands next to knock on heaven's door or to help with the soft landing or to pull back the curtain or to turn over and really go to sleep. Well, in conclusion, after all these years and about these three cases, I'd like to say this about dying. I don't recommend it. <laughs> As these cases show, we can avoid it maybe for a short time. We can try to make it aesthetically attractive, but that is difficult and rarely accomplished. We can try to avoid burdening the dying. It does seem like the least that we can do. A few questions if anybody has any. We still have two minutes left. This, I must say, it's a pleasure being in this group. I know I'm a bit of a ringer, but it, this group is on time. Almost, right? Anybody, questions or thoughts? I've got a question. Thank yes. you so thank you so much. That was just beautiful um, oh, and you. really speaks to me and my practice in palliative care. Yeah. Um, one thing that I think your um, your conversation about dying with a peaceful look makes me think about is um, I think hospice and palliative care have, as a field have created this expectation that if we come along, we'll make death perfect. And I, I just, I struggle with that and I, you're conveying something else. I mean, kind of a walking with or accompanying and a little bit of a mystery about what, um, what death is actually going to look like, and I wonder how we can help our families understand that a little bit, and even our even ourselves. Uh, that's a great question. The the question of, you know, that the expectation is if if you have a palliative care consult, the least they can do is get that good look. <laughs> and of course, what we're working against really is physiology. People have been pumped up in the ICU, pumped full of chock full of vitamins, antibiotics, and fluids. And um, then we come in, and also, I think youth makes it a tough uh, struggle to die. So many things uh, are working against us to get that good look, aren't they? 
What do you do? You know, I, um, I want to change the conversation a little bit from making the death perfect to the fact that I will walk with them no matter what happens. I, I don't think we can get that perfect look, and it is, a, it is a mystery. It really does strike me as a mystery why some people are able to have that at the end and other people aren't. Um, but I, um, I, don't, I think death is hard. I mean, like you said, I don't recommend it, and um, I, I think we can't, um, we are not the ones who can control that entirely. Now, we, tr we, we try with our, you know, everything we do, um, but we, we, can't, we can't control the outcome in, in that way. You know, we often use the metaphor, thank you, we often use the metaphor of uh, being born, but I don't, I don't think babies look that great when they come out, do you? <laughs> <laughs> don't look that beautiful. Uh, uh, nurses do a great job, I talk to nurses about this a bit, you know, and they really buff up the, pa the dead patient person before the family comes, but now that families are staying for the dying instead of leaving and coming back like they might have done years ago. The nurses don't get a chance to go in and, you know, wipe the saliva off and get things look, looking better for the person. Uh, but that's uh, still a big role that they do, and I, uh, I appreciate that role. That's a pretty thankless job, eh? Um, any other questions? Well, thanks for letting me talk. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, David. That was great. Thank you, Mark.